Welcome back to Historic Investments. Today we're going to talk about Colts. Now, for those of you who know me, I'm not particularly enamored of Colts. I do like a lot of early foreign semi-automatics, and guess what? Colt is not an early foreign semi-automatic, but Colt it is. And today what we're going to talk about is not just a 1911. We're going to talk about a very early Navy 1911. So let's look at the markings, look at some of the early changes, and while I'm at it, please like and subscribe. Hit that like button, and if you've got any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Although the U.S. Navy did not receive the very first Colt 1911s, they were pretty darn close. With their first shipment in March of 1912, including serial numbers 501 to 1000. If you like Colts, and if you didn't, you wouldn't be watching this video, you probably like the really early ones. Well, this is not the earliest variation. The earliest variation would have a super highly polished um, uh, large components and a peacock fire blued small components. And that basically was uh, passed over after serial number 2400. So if the gun has got a number greater than 2400, you're not going to find a peacock blued a safety, you're not going to see a peacock blue trigger or a slide release. This is probably the next best from the, the very earliest Colts because this gun indeed has all of the other earliest desirable features. For example, it's got the short spur hammer, it's got the rounded rear sight, it still has the uh, early uh, configuration a thumb release, and on the other side we'll kind of look at the uh, dimpled uh, method of securing the magazine catch. As per all of the uh, 1911s of this era, it's got a, a two-line address with the usual separations, and it's marked on the left side of the frame, United States property. One of the things that you should note carefully if you kind of collect these early guns is look at the inspector markings. The uh, guns from uh, early 1912 through October 1914 were all inspected by a Walter G. Penfield. So look at these initials. It should be WGP. And importantly, look really closely because you should see the metal weld up around these encircled initials. This was an inspection stamp that was struck after the guns were finished. So the metal around the stamp should be weld up. You should also pay attention to the slide. A number of these guns will have um, uh, replaced slides. So if you need to get, if you're, if you want to get an early Colt like this, it should have a uh, rampant Colt with the uh, within the uh, encirclement. Now let's flip to the other side. The right side of the gun is a little bit easier to evaluate. Certainly, there are many fewer markings. If you look at it and tilt it just the right way, you'll also you'll often see that. Yeah, the, even though it's polished, you can see some of the mill marks, and importantly, if you look really close, you'll see a few little ripples in the finish. The other thing is you look really closely, let's try to cone in right here on these markings, you'll see where it says model of 1911 U.S. Navy. This was marked before the guns were finished, so there shouldn't be any weld up metal around the markings. Interestingly, the serial number was struck after the gun was finished, just like the um, uh, Walter G. Um, uh, Penfield inspector marking. So these markings, this uh, serial number marking, should be uh, cut through the blue, and you, if you really look at it closely, the metal should be weld up around the numerals. Another interesting thing that you'll see in these uh, very early guns is the method in which the magazine catch is retained. This is referred to as a dimpled magazine uh, catch lock. You'll see there's no slotted screw here. It's just a, a dimpled part, and then there's a there's a little recess right there in front of it that you should barely be able to see. And I'm going to just turn the gun just a little bit so now you can get a better idea of the rounded rear sight. There's the rounded rear sight and in profile you can see the short stub hammer. Now if you're looking at these guns and you say, well, I don't know, maybe could the gun be refinished, yes or no? This is a key part to look at. Let's see if we can zoom in right here. Usually when people are refinishing the guns, they don't pay too much attention to the back of the slide and the back of the frame. So if you look very closely right here, you'll see rounded areas at the back of the slide and rounded areas right here in this part of the frame. This is the way it should look. You should see these edges and the um, uh, mill marks just uh, uh, perfectly uh, just squared to the edges. The same thing has, 
is true here. The other thing to kind of look at when you're evaluating the gun is you look at the overall finish and, and look here at the barrels. A lot of the barrels has been replaced. So make sure that the condition of the barrel is consistent with the condition of the rest of the gun. As you know, when the guns are cycled, you're going to get some wear here, so that's normal. But these, the top of the barrels in these early guns was uh, oil quench, and they've got a much bluer hue than you would see in later guns that have got a much blacker tone. Other parts of the guns that often show wear, of course, right around the muzzle, right around the front of the trigger guard, and the grip straps. Now, this is a, uh, you know, a particularly high-condition gun, but you do see it's got a few little nicks here and there on the, on the grip strap. It's really, really tough to find a, a Navy pistol that's, especially one that this, that's this old, that is truly pristine. You know that uh, expression, used hard and put away wet. Well, when the Navy people put their guns away wet, it was wet in salt water. So these guns were subject to a lot of corrosion, and this would just be a, a spectacular example. Now, before you guys head out, one of the last things I want to touch on is the business of magazines, because as you probably heard, people like to have a correct magazine. So what would be a correct magazine? This particular gun is a... Uh, an example of the third shipment uh, sent to the Navy. Uh, this particular gun was actually uh, shipped in May of 1912, and at that point, Colt was still using its earliest configuration 1911 magazine. So what does that mean? Well, let's cut to the magazines and we'll give you a guided tour. So, you were fortunate enough to buy your early Colt 1911 and you want the correct magazine. Well, which is the correct magazine? Well. If you like these guns, you probably say, well, just get one with a lanyard loop. That's probably right. Well, you'd be right about part of that. It is probably right. That's one component. The other thing is, what does the rest of the magazine look like? Well, the earliest Colt magazines had exposed bases. So if you kind of look at all of these, this is the only one that's got an exposed base with a couple of pins, right? All of these have captured bases. So the earliest guns had magazines with an exposed base. Now the problem with the earliest magazines is they tended to crack. So where do you look for the cracks? You look for the cracks right in this area. So to address this concern, Colt actually put a little recess in to, to kind of stress relieve the metal. So you've probably heard the expression a keyhole magazine. So this is the first kind of magazine. And these magazines were used to about serial number 4,500. So if you have a gun, which is serial number 3,075 like this one, this is the magazine you want. Remember, Colt magazines are not numbered. You have to go by their configuration. This is the one you want for this gun. All right, I'm going to put that aside. Let's go on to the second kind of magazine. So the first magazine broke in those areas and Colt then recessed a number of these, and this is called a keyhole magazine. This was the replacement magazine. So, from the side it looks the same, it's got the same kind of lanyard loop, but it's got the keyhole configuration at the upper spine. So this is the correct magazine, the second variation magazine. But in the end, Colt changed the tempering process and a few other things, and this keyholing was not felt necessary. So here we have the third kind of magazine, which, as you can see, is very, very similar to the first one. The only difference is this one has an exposed base and this one has got the hidden base. So this one has got the pins on top of the exposed base and in this one the pins actually are through the base of the magazine. An excellent magazine. This one was used uh, through the end of uh, World War I and, and maybe even a little bit longer than that. But for those of you who are mostly familiar with World War II mags, this is an example of a uh, late Colt magazine. And sometimes you'll find early World War I guns with late magazines. It is a military magazine. And again, lots of times these magazines got swapped out. Um, fortunately for the military, they all work equally well, but if you're a collector, what you would like is the early Colt magazine. Now, one final thing I'd like to touch on, and that is the business of getting a factory letter. A very short digression. I know a lot of you guys out there like factory letters, and one of the first questions for an exotic gun or an expensive gun, well, did you get a Colt factory letter? Well, here's an example of a factory letter, and let's take a look at the information that it imparts. 
Yes, it confirms the serial number, which in this case is 3075. It confirms that it is indeed a 45 caliber Colt with a 5-inch barrel. It's left with a blued finish. It went to the U.S. government in the Navy Yard in Brooklyn, New York on June 1, 1912. The guns in this particular shipment were 1,000. Well, you know, that's exactly the same information that you can find in any of at least three reference books I can think about. So what does that factory add? Well, it's really nice if you think that Billie Jean Haynes is, an in the, it's, is a, a very important person and her signature is worth keeping and it well may be worth keeping, but is it really worth paying $200 to get the same information you could get elsewhere? But if you have just a standard 1911 or a standard 1911A1, I don't really think it adds very much to get a factory letter. It doesn't tell you if the gun is original finish or if it's been reblued. It doesn't tell you if the grips are original. It doesn't tell you if the screws are original. And it sure doesn't tell you if it's got an original magazine. So is it nice? Yeah. Is it important for this particular uh, type of firearm? I'd say not so important, but you guys be the judge. Hopefully you've picked up a few interesting tidbits that will help you in collecting Colts, particularly the 1911 Navy model. But regardless of which type of Colt you collect, I would strongly recommend this reference book by Scott Meadows. It's really got a treasure trove of information. You guys at the Colt Factory, factory letters are great, but for the cost of a factory letter, this one was $200, you can buy this book and get all of the information in a factory letter, plus much, much more. Scott, I hope you enjoyed that plug. In any event, Good luck with your search for Colts and good collecting.